Last week I, uh, I gave y'all a slip here with the guy's uh, name on it for YouTube. And anybody go and watch it, check it out. Wow, Wanda, raise your hand. You can watch at least some of it. Nobody else did? Let's see if I can. Oh, Karen did. All right. I was going to ask you what your thoughts. So any thoughts or? No. Okay. All right. Anyways, I just thought I'd throw that out. But his name is still written on the last week's paper, I think. So uh, right. if you got that paper, so. All right. I uh, don't want to do too much in the way of review because I always get behind when I do that. But I do want to, we kind of rushed out of the lesson last, uh, last time. Uh, and I think I gave you the answers. But just a reminder of how we ended chapter 14, Revelation chapter 14. Also remi a reminder that the uh, chapter 14 was a, uh, a chapter that gave uh, John seven visions, basically. And it's not titled that way. But seven, he saw seven things, seven visions. And what was the purpose? Anybody remember what, the, uh, what seemingly the purpose for those seven visions? What was the overriding theme or the purpose why God was maybe showing John these things at that particular time? Anybody remember? Well, I'm failing as a teacher. Right. Maybe someone else teaches this class. Right. But that's why we were here. Oh, maybe so. I never knew it was the team. Yes, yes, Kathy. Very good. Hope for believers. Thank you, Kathy. All right. Uh, basically, encouragement. Just a reminder of, of there's victory in all this. And and John would have been encouraged, I would have to, to hear that because uh, the, the words before that, the, the chapters before that, uh, everything that he was seeing was pretty much overwhelming and, and, and all that. And it just seemed like Satan was gaining momentum instead of, instead of being defeated and all those kind of things. Uh, especially as you see chapter 13 unfold. Uh, because we were right here in the middle where the, uh, the dragon where Satan is cast down to the earth. And, uh, and all this, the, the, the havoc that he wreaks uh, when he gets there. And so, uh, so then all of a sudden, uh, it's like God backs up. And this is intentional, so I don't know. But it's like God backs up and says, let me just remind you uh, of the victories and all this. That God, you know, this is part of the story and all this must take place. But, uh, but remember the end of the story. And so in these divisions, were also not necessarily in chronological order. So reading chapter 14 is a little bit kind of throws your mind around because it's uh, it's kind of just talking about some things, and reminders, and not necessarily giving you a play-by-play -play, uh, thing of how, how things are coming about. So the end of, four, of chapter 14 where we left off was the sixth and the seventh, the final two visions that he saw in this portion. And, uh, and basically what he keeps seeing was these angels. In verse 14 through 16, he saw an angel. We'd already been seeing angels, but he saw an angel with a sickle. All right, and what was the angel coming to do? Harvest the earth. Harvest the earth. All right, so uh, he was coming to harvest the earth, and then he saw another angel that was coming out of the temple. And what did that angel do? He said, "It's time to reap." So that angel, the other angel, it's time to reap the harvest of the earth, which is an indication that the first angel, though said as though, as though the son of man or whatever, but it would not have been talking about Jesus because no angel is going to command Jesus what to do. Uh, but there is a harvest that Jesus has, and, and that comes out clear as well. Uh, the end time harvest, we gave you the references, and we'll go through that, but those references in Matthew and the Old Testament in Joel, talking about Armageddon. Also, the good harvest that Jesus is responsible for, uh, uh, the good grapes, the, the, all that kind of stuff, uh, the good harvest is a reference back to Matthew 3.17. So, anytime you hear those references of harvest, a lot of people think that, oh, great, everything's ripe and ready and time to harvest and we get to enjoy the fruits because what John was seeing in, in this vision was a time to harvest the, the lostness and those kind of things, all right? Uh, and then, in, so that was uh, vision number six, basically. And then the last vision, the end of chapter 14, um, he saw another angel. I give you the answers on tonight's sheet just as a review. But he saw another angel coming out of the temple, and he also had a sharp uh, sickle. And the angel was in charge of fire, and he said, it's time to gather the clusters. So once again, talking about like clusters of grapes. And so we had that happen, uh, and that's from the earth as well, um, because they are, uh, they are right. And so it was time. A reminder that God has the timing for everything. And so when all this takes place, it's in God's perfect timing. And we're waiting on God's perfect timing for this event right here. <laughs> 
there's a time. This isn't left open. He knows exactly the very second that the, the twinkling of the eye rapture will take place and the church will be out of here. He knows when that moment is set. And it is set, but we don't know when it is, but he does. All right, so we see another sign of God's perfect timing. Uh, the harvest was then thrown into the great wine press. Uh, that's where we kind of rushed out here. And I, I had my map and I stole it for this morning's Sunday school lesson. I've got to bring it back, all right? But I wanted to share a little bit last week. Uh, it says in the, the end of uh, chapter 14 that the harvest, those, those clusters of grapes, the harvest that the angel came with the sickle and harvested that <laughs> and put it in, it was to put it in the wine press of God's wrath. All right? And that's another indication of understanding the exact harvest that it's referring to there. Not a good one because you take the good harvest. By the way, this this is a good harvest, all right? To harvest the, the church, the, the New Testament believers, that's the good harvest. If he comes and he collects us and takes us to heaven, that's a good, good harvest. That harvest didn't go into the wine press of God's wrath, all right? Uh, but this harvest that we see here does. And when that happens, it says that the blood, this is the reference that you occasionally hear or people kind of know where it says that the, the blood will flow as, as high as the, the bridle of a horse. Horse is bridle, okay? And so that's, would that be about that deep? Yeah. The horse land. Land? Yeah, all right, okay. Land to horses, it's right up here, all right? <laughs> all right, so imagine, imagine blood running this deep. Now, I, I've heard this for years and years, and it's just an image. Um, this is not, uh, it was not saying that the blood over the whole face of the earth, like on the flood, that flooded the whole earth or something like that. It specifically said for about 180 miles. Now, the reason I have my map, and if you can envision your Bible map, you always turn in the back and you see your Bible map, and up here it's got the Sea of Galilee, it's got the Jordan River that drops down to the Dead Sea, and right, uh, right before you get to the Dead Sea, you see Jericho, you see Jerusalem, all right? So, roughly from, uh, from the Dead Sea to the Sea of Galilee is approximately 100 miles. All right, so if you're talking about 100 miles, you're gonna to have to come down a little bit before, uh, below the Dead Sea and above the Sea of Galilee. So basically, the reference here is saying that for the distance of the nation of Israel, the actual land uh, distance from north to south in Israel would be 180 miles, all right? So that blood, this deep, flowed for 180 miles. Now it's a reference. It's not symbolic. It's not, but it's not uh, an, it's not a, well, it's kind of hard to describe that. And if you think about it, uh, if, if you're familiar with the terrain at all over there, it's not uh, Kansas, all right? If, if, if something was this deep in Kansas, it's everywhere, right? Because <laughs> there, there are no hills, no valleys, no mountains, or anything basically in, in uh, Kansas. I've driven through it many times. So, uh, but if you think of valley, if you think of a valley, if you think of an area going from north to south, it's still the blood would flow there, and it's a description. Now, I'm gonna I'm gonna really mess with our our mind if we don't get this straight. So if you hear me bouncing back and forth, hang on. And if you don't understand, if I make it more confusing than it is already, uh, ask me questions to clarify. All right? Because this chapter 14, when it references this harvesting of the earth, all right? Remember, we're, we're right here in chapter 14. We're, 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 uh, we're seeing that we have the three angels and those kind of things. We've always seen what took place in chapter 12 and 13 and all that. We're right here in the tribulation period. But when it talks about this, remember I said chapter 14 is not necessarily in sequence. It's not, it's not just on this happened and this happened and this happened, all right? So when he makes this reference, when do you think this took place or will take place? But the blood will be that deep for 180 miles. Armageddon. All right. So we're looking forward in chapter 15, or in chapter 14, the end of chapter 14. We're looking forward to our, not looking forward to, I can't, we're excited. No, we're looking in the future to Armageddon, to all that take place there. So it's a reminder of God's judgment on the earth, on wicked man, on those who reject God, reject Christ, that there is judgment to come. And so while that's not thrilling for us, it's a reminder that God is victorious. Sin is not victorious. Satan is not victorious. He doesn't win in the end and, and all that, even though in, in this portion of the thing, he's got the upper hand on humanity, all right? Because he's already enacted the mark of the beast. 
He's already demanded worship of himself, the false prophet. Uh, it says worship him, and all that is, is taking place. It seems like he is just, since he was cast to the earth, he's just taken over and he's winning. He's, he doesn't win, all right? And so the reminder of that. All right. Now you ready for chapter 15? I'm already at a break. Oh my goodness. All right. Okay. Now, chapter 15 uh, is the preparation for the bowl judgments. All right. And uh, we're going to work. Chapter 15 is the shortest chapter, and it's almost taken me the longest to study. Not that there's so much studying, but there, there's a lot there. And, and yet it's the shortest chapter. It's just eight verses. All right. You think we can get that done in 15 minutes or so and be out of here early? No way. All right. In fact, we may be late. All right. We should be. But just realize that chapter 15 is a preparation for the bold judgments. Uh, let me go ahead and just jump in and have someone read verse 1. We're just going to take this uh, a verse or so at a time because it's so short. And we we'll kind of want to work our way into this. And then we're going to be looking at a lot of other scriptures or at least referencing a lot as well. Who'd like to read 51? Okay. You got it. I saw in heaven another great and marvelous sign, seven angels with the seven last place. Last because with them God grants his people. All right, so coming out of 14, out of seeing those visions, and again, I'll remind ourselves and maybe for the millionth time, there were no chapters and verses when, when he saw this or wrote this or anything like that. He simply wrote what he saw. But as he came out of that, seeing those seven visions kind of thing of, of reminding and hope kind of snaps back to then, then what happened after that. And so then he says, I saw another sign. As you're filling the blank there, I saw another sign. I almost messed up and gave you a, a sheet with all the answers. I'm so glad I, I didn't tonight, all right? Uh, in, in chapter 15, verse 1, he sees another sign. Now there are three great signs from heaven or in heaven that John is, is in the process of seeing. Now we've got to we got to think of our chapter and verse. We've got to think of where we are in the story. And hold on to this, all right? Three great signs, and this is the third of the three great signs. So let's make sure we get this. The first sign uh, was in chapter 12, verse 1. So if you were on chapter 15, he's talking about, I saw another great sign, and yet we'd have to go back several weeks in our study to go back to chapter 12 to see what the first sign was. What was the first sign that he saw in heaven? The woman, all right? Uh, put Israel. In your blank, just put Israel. And then off to the side, I give you that reference. Chapter 12, verse 1, he said, I saw a great sign in heaven. So this is before he saw those visions. He saw this first great sign, which was a sun-clothed woman. Uh, here she is right here, okay? Here's the sun-clothed woman that he saw in heaven. And who was that? Israel. All right. Remember chapter 12, we're kind of getting a history lesson. And so he begins to describe Israel, not just Israel at this point in the tribulation, because he's seeing the, the sun clothed woman in, in, the, in this heavenly sign. He's watching a DVD or a VHS tape or something like that. He's seeing this hologram. Whatever vision and however he sees this uh, sun clothed uh, woman, it's it's the it represents Israel, and it really begins. If you go back and look at that, it begin it tells the history of Israel and what has taken place since uh, Israel became a nation, but especially when the woman was pregnant, so Israel was pregnant, or Mary was pregnant with Jesus, all right. And then as that was happening, you got this red. Uh, a dragon thing, and that dragon is just waiting for her to give birth so she can snatch the baby. So that's going back to the first sign that he saw in, in heaven was Israel. Uh, then the second sign goes to verse 3 in that same chapter, and that sign was Satan. All right? Put Satan, I give you the reference, he actually saw a red dragon. But I just want to clarify, it's easier to say he saw the vision. The first vision was about Israel, the second vision was about Satan. Satan as a red dragon. Here's, here's the vision he saw up here, all right? I should have done that in red, but anyways, I didn't get it color-coded up on my map here. But he sees this, this, this great red dragon up in heaven. Once again, he doesn't just say at this point, mid-tribulation, this is what's happening now. In chapter 12, he's given somewhat of a history lesson, and he's looking back to the history of Satan. Satan has quite a history, doesn't he? He's kind of an old angel, all right? He goes back to the beginning of the creation of the angels. He goes back to 
pre-sin uh, on the earth and all that kind of stuff, when he was in heaven, just as a beautiful angel of light, created uh, to worship God and to serve God, and he did for a while until he got the big head, decided he could be greater than his creator, and tried to ascend above God, and God said, no, you won't, <laughs> and kicked him out of heaven. And so we see a bit of a history going back to when he was kicked out of heaven in the first place, then bringing us to the actual point in our, what I believe is our near future, when he will be kicked out of the heavens, not the presence of God heaven, but the third heaven, but it, he is the prince of the power of the air. And so we saw that back in chapter 12 that he was, that he was cast, he had a battle with Michael and the angels, and was cast down to the earth. And so that was the second vision that he saw. Now, then we have chapter 13 and chapter 14. It took so a few weeks to work through that. Now we're in chapter 15, and we're back to seeing those great signs in heaven. So I wanted to give you all that background so you can place this very first first verse, all right? Uh, now, there you got your fill in the blank is then the third, this third sign that he saw was seven angels. Seven angels. And the seven angels now, the reference here uh, is that they, the seven angels had uh, the last, that's your fill in the blank, the last seven plagues. The last seven plagues, all right? Now watch this, everybody. Okay. We're gonna, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to demonstrate what will now unfold, all right? I need seven volunteers. Good. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Perfect. All right. All right. Y'all stand up for me for just a minute. All right. All right. All right. Uh, no, don't get left behind. I'm just not, all right. These are seven angels. Let's hear for our seven angels. All right. All right. So these seven angels that John John now sees, all right, are given seven goals. That works. You can do it, all right. <laughs> All right, hold your, angels, hold your bowls like angels. Okay, so we have this vision of these seven angels, and they've got these bowls, and John sees those, okay? Now, these seven bowls, as this is going to play out now, has the final place they're going to be on, on, on earth that are cast down, all right? We've already been talking about this event that's about to take place uh, for some time, okay? Now, here's what I want, my angels, are you ready? Okay, here's what I want you to do. On the count of three, I want you to dump your bowl out. Okay, ready? Are you watching? One, two. Wait, where did you go? Why did you do this? Give me those. We're not ready for that. All right. I'm not ready for that. I'm not ready for that. I'm ready for that. All right. Let's see what we're doing. All right. Boy, they would have done a good job, too. All right. All right. So what, what John is now saying is, is, is the setup. This is the preparation for the seven bowls, all right? And so just as he's seeing this, realize that it's not just like here, and then there's the seven bowls, and we're done. The count of three, go. You know, it doesn't happen that way. But what's important to see is what I want you to see is that in a, in a momentary flash so you can understand how it's going to play out, how it's connected to all the scriptures around it, because when it talks about these being the last Plagues. That's significant. It's real significant in getting the bigger picture. Now, this this that you just saw, when he sees this about to unfold, and this, we're not going to get to see it. Chapter 16 is when we see it. Okay, so this is chapter 16 is the one, two, three, go. And it'd be boom, 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 one by one, they'd go, all right? Uh, but this is the completion of chapter 16 when we'll see this. So we make it to it next week, we'll see. Someone read. The last few words of chapter 16, verse 17. The, the last statement in, in verse 17. What does it say, Gene? Because the plagues were so terrible. Uh, the last few words. Well, I'll take it. Go ahead and read the whole thing, 17. But that's 17 uh, <coughs> chapter 16, verse 17. The last three words. The last three words. What does it say, Sheila? It is done. It is done. All right. Yeah. All right. It is done. Okay. Now, that it is done, what you almost saw right there, will be done. Okay, so we get that picture right there. When he sees this, it is it, it, it is the judgment being completed, and yet we're not going to get to that until the next chapter. But this is the setup for that. Now, 
That statement, the end of chapter 16, it is done, will take us back to chapter 11, verse 19. Someone read 11, 19. I think I wrote those references down for you. I want you to see these today. Anybody know how to, how to do a, a macrame? Nobody back in my mom taught me how to macrame. I, or I had a, a macrame hanger and all that. Anyways, you make a rope and you twine, twine those things together and you tie knots. Some of you make those bracelets with them and all that kind of stuff. And you have to twist and turn and all that kind of stuff. That's what these scriptures are going to show us. That there's a twisting and a turning to bring all these scriptures together of what's taking place right now. So what is 1119? Who's got it? Who wants to read it? God's temple in heaven was open. And when it, within his temple was seen the ark of the covenant and there came flashes of lightning, rumbling, hurled of heat, filled with thunder, and earthquake, and a great hailstorm. All right. So chapter 11 ended with a description that would take place in the future. And what it was describing that would take place is what we just read in chapter 16, verse 7, when he said, It is finished. Well, Heavenly started pouring out the bowl. But realize that we had this reference clear back in chapter 11 of, of the looking forward to the end time event. Now, if you've got your notebook from previous weeks, let me just say, since I made that reference to chapter 11, go back to uh, last week's lesson or the week before, chapter 14. I gave you a little bit of a, uh, as we talked about chapter 14 and the seven visions that, that uh, John was going to see, I reminded you where we were in the in the laying out of Revelation. I reminded you that chapter 12, we just heard from chapter 11, where it gave that vision of what would happen, that it is finished, the chapter uh, 16 said, all right? We saw it in, in the end of chapter 11. But then we went into chapter 12. In chapter 12, we, we kind of stalled out again. Kind of have this reference that now is before what happens at the end of 11 plays out. He says, no, wait a minute. He gives us chapter 12, and, uh, 12, which dealt primarily with Israel. So before that started happening, the seven bowls or the finishing judgment, we've got a history lesson on Israel. And then in chapter 13, we still were in this, in this uh, interlude again. And in 13, we get the story of the dragon. All right, Really, the story of the satanic trinity. And so we saw when the dragon was cast down, we had the beast, the false prophet, uh, and, and the dragon. We see this unholy, this evil uh, uh, trinity type thing of Satan. And that's what chapter 13 was talking about. That's why John needed chapter 14. Because he saw those things in 13 and thought, wow, this is evil. This is terrible. This one world government. This, this powerhouse. This, this, uh, this system that the devil sets up where, where you get the mark of the beast. And you have to uh, pledge your allegiance uh, to the devil or else uh, you're, you're killed. All this set up in the false religion, false prophet, and all this kind of stuff. He sees that in chapter 13. Then he goes to chapter 14, and we spent two weeks to go through. And chapter 14 was these visions of the victory. So once again, right after 11 ends, and it says, you know, we saw this hailstorm, we saw this judgment. That's again referring to really the closure of the Trinity period, the tribulation period. All right. So chapter 11. Arthur, chapter 12, we're talking about Israel. Chapter 13, talking about the Satanic Trinity. Uh, and then cha chapter 14, just seeing these other visions. And then boom, we're put right back to the seeing the visions in heaven or these big signs in heaven. The first one being the sign of... of uh, I lost my track now. The first one being the sign of Israel. The second one being the, the, sign, uh, the sign in heaven of Satan and what happened there. And now this vision that we're seeing with those beautiful angels that just stood up with the poles, all right? That's what we're seeing. And all this is a sign of completion. Now let me add to my little, let me twist my little rope one more time, all right? As we see that tie into chapter 11 and what happens in 12 and 13 and even 14, this idea of completion of God's wrath, this wine press, uh, the, the, the sickle that came in chapter 14, the end of chapter 14, all this really takes us back clear over here to the seventh trumpet, right? So we have the seven seals broken open, and then we have the second seven trumpets, and then we saw in, in, in chapter 11 the, the seventh trumpet being sounded. And we remind ourselves that the seventh, the seventh trumpet is what? 
the bold judgments. All right. So when we got here, you'll go, wow, now it's time to start the last phase. And yet we had all these things that we had that God uh, included in the descriptions right here. So when we talk about what we just saw right here, that's really what this was announcing before the red, the red dragon was cast out of heaven and all that stuff. He sounded the trumpet, all right? The, the seventh trumpet now, the seventh trumpet, which is the seven bowls, all right? The seventh trumpet, which is the seven bowls, really is a description, really contains chapter 15, verse 1, where we start tonight, get this, all the way forward to chapter 19, verse 6, all right? Uh, 19 verse 6. Someone read 19 verse 6. I don't know if it's fair to do that. Let's go ahead and look forward. We'll get there someday. All right. 19 verse. Now we're looking forward, not just back to where we've been, tying it all together. 19 verse 6. Who's got it? That's okay. Everyone's got it. Okay. And so that, that hallelujah chorus, that thing that happens in chapter 19, verse 6, is then after all this takes place, which we haven't even started describing what's going to take place in the seventh trumpet, which is the seven, seven bowls. And so all that describes this right here, and we have this hallelujah chorus being sung um, by, the, by the angels, by the, uh, the church, by everyone uh, singing this song. And that's what's described in 19, 6. Now, We'll get there later, but in 19.7, the very next uh, verses after that, begins to talk about the marriage feast of the Lamb. Wow, has it been a long time since we've talked about the marriage feast of the Lamb, other than making reference to it. We talked about the marriage feast of the Lamb when we talked about the rapture of the church uh, in chapter 4, right? And in chapter 4, the, the church was, uh, no longer is described in Revelation because the church is no longer there. But it does. But we looked at other references that talked about sometime between the time we're raptured and the time that we come back with Christ at the battle of Armageddon, sometime in between there is the marriage feast of the Lamb. That's in heaven. That's with the church. It's not with the 144,000 Jews that are sealed. It's not with the martyrs that are martyred any time during the tribulation period. The marriage feast of the Lamb is, is the, the saints in heaven that were, that were raptured. But we'll talk about it in chapter 19. So I just wanted to kind of, since we're going backwards and forward, realize that once again, when we get to that, it talks about what takes place, but it doesn't necessarily take place at that time. Okay, so I brought you all the way to 19:6 to say uh, chapter 19, verse 6 to say that's looking forward to the completion of the seven bold judgments, and then the very next reference. Now, from there on out, we're talking about um, the, the uh, marriage feast of the Lamb and the bride coming back, and what takes place after that. So it takes a while to get from 15 to where we're at there, but all this ties together to the completion of God's. Judgment. This is also the third woe. That takes us back to chapter 11 as well. When I say this, this preparation in 15 for what will happen in 16, which is the completion of the seventh trumpet, the bowl of judgments, all this is the third woe. So we have three woes back here. I know I've said this before, but I just keep saying so we could take us back. Three woes here, the first one. The second one, oh, is that the first woe, the second woe, and the, the trumpet was the third woe, and the third woe is woe. Here it comes. Here comes the final judgment, the wrath of God, the wine press, and all that third woe. You basically can say the third woe is the last three and a half years of the tribulation. All right. So even though we're kind of you know, getting all kinds of stuff uh, tied into this uh, this figure, that's what we're talking about. All that in verse 1. You see why it's just like, God, we've got to tie it all together. All right? I don't just want to say, okay, there is an angel or another sign in heaven. All right. Let's move on then to uh, verse 2. If you'd like to read that. I'm so tied up in this board. Hold on. Get out of my way. All right. Who wants to read chapter 2? Verse 2. Sorry. Verse 2. Thank you. And I saw something like a sea of glass mixed with fire. And those who had been victorious over the beast in his image and the number of his name standing on the sea of glass, holding parts of God. All right. Wow. So he sees the sign in heaven, and he just describes seven angels that are given these seven bowls, and then that's why, like, I stopped them. Wait a minute. 
we're not quite ready for for you to pour your bowls out. We'll get that in chapter 16. But before that, immediately he says, and then I saw something else. I saw these seven angels, but then I saw this, this glassy sea mixed with fire. Uh, and so you fill in the blank, it's the glassy sea which is mixed with fire. That's interesting. This is the second time we've seen a glassy sea, all right? The first glassy sea was clear, clear as crystal, all right? That references chapter 4. Wow, let's go way back in the book of Revelation, all right? That goes way back to chapter 4, which is right immediately after the rapture. And John sees this glassy sea, this crystal clear around the throne. And what was that sea? The sea in the Bible references the masses of humanity. Fill in your blank, all right? The sea represents the, the, the masses in humanity. And, and among the masses of humanity throughout history, back in chapter 4, verse 6, when he saw the clear crystal sea, he saw the masses that had received Christ and had been raptured. Basically, he sees the church. And so that's your fill in the blank underneath the humanity. C represents the masses of humanity. The first C was the church, basically. And you can say the church and Old Testament saints and all that. But basically, it was the scene that he came upon when the church was raptured. Now this this C that he sees, he sees the angels with the bowls, and then he sees this this C, which still represents humanity or the, the masses of humanity. But here, it's mixed with fire. That's interesting that it's being mixed with fire. When the first one was clear, this one is a sea mixed with fire. Fire represents what? In the, what? Okay, cleansing. I'll give you that. That's not the word I want you to... Was what? Wrath. Wrath. Uh, okay, it, will there be fire uh, uh, represented uh, here at the altar at the judgment seat of Christ? Will there be fire? Yes? No? Yes, because because what is placed on the altar at the judgment seat of Christ? Our works. Alright? We're, we're not judged in that whether or not we get to go to heaven, we're already in heaven. But our works will be placed on the altar, and that fire will consume all the works that were worthless. And only what was really done for God that was genuine uh, will last through that. Alright? And we're we're all going to heaven after that. But it's judgment. Right, so you say wrath. The wrath there, God's fire does, does represent God's wrath, but with wrath comes the judgment. With the uh, with the <coughs> altar there, it's not judgment. So here we've kind of got all this going on. All right, <clears throat> the judgment. The uh, the second C that he sees. If the first C is the church, the second C out of humanity, out of the fire. And I don't get. I don't. This isn't. 100%, all right? This is just a description of what it means that the sea was mixed with fire. But the sea, this time, is talking, well, this is clear. This is clear out of Scripture. It represents the martyrs, all right? The martyrs, that's your fill in the blank. <clears throat> and not just any martyrs. There have been martyrs all throughout history. Even before the nation of Israel, there were martyrs, all right? During the nation of Israel, there were martyrs, those that died for the sake of, of God and, and those kind of things. In the New Testament, for 2,000 years, those have been, there have been those who have died for the sake of Christ. And those martyrs are among that those that have actually given their life to stand up for Christ. But this group of martyrs, with that mixture of fire, is talking about those that come out of, not just out of tribulation, but specifically this seventh trumpet, these bold judgments, this final stage of the judgment. It's those martyrs, okay? I'll tell you one other thing the fire may represent, but you have a question? One, I have two. Two questions, all right. I've got lost here. The okay. first C was the, the, fir the, the first C is the church. Uh, the, 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 the C represents the masses of humanity. Is the first fill in the blank? Underneath that, the first C equals the church. Okay, this one's top above that. Oh. Right above that, okay. The glass of C was mixed with fire. In the parentheses, the first C was clear. The first C that was referenced was back in ch chapter 4, verse 6. It was a clear crystal C. And that was the C of, of the church, the believers that were raptured. And the fire represents. Okay, now, okay, there was no fire in that first C, all right? I was just saying, this one's mixed with fire, but this is the second time we've heard that. The fire represents judgment. Okay? Um, 
wrath and cleansing would be uh, uh Rita said uh, uh cleansing that's kind of your know, word cleansed by fire that's a, that's one thing fire does and all that kind of stuff but hold on to the idea that fire represents judgment now when it talks about judgment and those that were martyrs martyred i'll tell you the second reference that i, I read that it could be uh it could be talking about babylon babylon's going to burn all right <laughs> remember babylon we got babylon right here my little tower and Babylon and everything. If Babylon's not the city, then what does it represent? It's not actually talking about the town or the city of Babylon. Back in the day of Nebuchadnezzar, in the Old Testament, there was a Babylon. You could go and visit Babylon. And if you did, you knock on Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar's door and say, hey, Nebi, how you doing? You know, and you can go there, all right? But if it's not saying that the place is what's significant, what is significant about it? The evil system, very good. And this evil system is what the Antichrist sets up at the beginning in, in the, uh, saying it's a peaceful uh, setup, turns evil and wicked, especially when the dragon comes down to earth and, and empowers this whole system. And this final stage of the evil system is what is the setup for Babylon. When it talks about Babylon, remember, uh, like in 14, the encouragement of what the end of the story is, is Babylon's not going to be this great world power. It's not going to be a world power like in Nebuchadnezzar where they had two or three kings or however many they did. And it, was, it was a world power for a long time. It's not. It's a world power, world domination. I wouldn't even call it world domination in here. It's just out of necessity that the world comes together and says, we're going to have to make sense of this. All the millions of people disappearing and all the kind of stuff. So we'll make sense of it. And we first thing we need to do is figure out how to currency. So we're going to have one more currency. And then we can't have all these little countries. Everybody's in chaos. We just need to come together as the world family. And they set up a system so that the world is just one big happy place. All getting along in, the, in, in trying times. Satan has the other plan. So when it turns into here, it's evil Babylon. It's that spirit that Satan's been working all along. And evil Babylon takes place. And so it could be this crystal sea is a humanity with evil Babylon system set up that's going to end up being destroyed. And so that could be the fire that it's talking about. All right. The other thing could be these are the saints that come out of the trial, more like what you were talking about, Rita, come out of the fire that are cleansed by the fire. All right. If this is talking about the martyrs that come out of here. That's what it could be talking about. Um, tribulation saints... Okay, so that's what we're talking about. Tribulation saints, particularly in this case, the martyrs. Those saints have endured through this portion right here when they become martyrs. They have endured fiery trials. All right? Fiery persecution. They weren't just rejected or persecuted or put down or, or, or whatever. They were persecuted severely by all the powers of evil Babylon system, Antichrist, the world power, everything, all right? Uh, that's what they, these martyrs that he sees in the second verse, that's what they've come out of. Hal Lindsey says, that, puts it this way, if you know who Hal Lindsey is. He says, these martyrs, this glassy sea mixed with fire, all right? This, this glassy sea, they will be delivered through fire, not out of it. In other words, they don't get to avoid the fire. They have to go through the fire. Every one of these that he sees in this vision, uh, this isn't a vision, as he just sees this unfolding, are the martyrs that come through this persecution and it has cost them their life. All right? But it's purified. All right? This is not a bad thing. It's a good thing um, that they come through this. All right? All right. Uh, now, after this, after he sees the, this sea that's mixed with fire, all of a sudden, it, what does the rest of that verse say? Uh, verse, verse 2. What was the last part of that? What do they have? Or harps. They have harps, all right? This is the harp choir. I wish John was in here so I could talk to him about the harp choir, all right? Um, this is the, this is, these martyrs, this sea, which is the, the, those that come out of the mass of humanity that's burning, burning, all right? They come out, they're brought out of that. By the way, that may be the reference where it says these are standing next to the sea. All right? Not in the sea. They come out of the sea and they're standing next to the sea. They're the martyrs that have come out of this tri tri fiery persecution. 
and they're handed these harps. And it's just a beautiful picture. Really. They're handed these harps, and who gives them their instrument? God does, all right? God gives them each a harp. Now, we may be talking about thousands. We may be talking about tens of thousands. It doesn't give us a number, but it's a multitude. It's a lot of people. This is an encouraging thing for us to realize that even at the worst of the worst of the worst time, as it's being forced upon them, there will be those that say, you can take my life, but you can't get me to, to, to give my allegiance to the, fall, to, the, to, to the devil or to this world leader, to the Antichrist. They won't do it. Therefore, they'll be killed. They can't buy or sell. They'll be found. They'll hide out to do whatever they have to, or they'll just stand up there and say, here I am. You might as well kill me now because I'm not going to do it. And they won't take the mark, and they come out of that. And they're rewarded for it, all right? They're rewarded for it. They get to go exactly immediately to heaven. That's a wonderful thing. Um, Wiersbe says it this way. Warren, Warren Wiersbe, the commentator, he says it this way. This entire scene, all right, of them coming out of that, uh, oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. Read verse 3 and 4, all right? <laughs> I'm going to get on. Okay. And we're going to run out of time anyway. So who wants to read 3 and 4? I'm going to give two verses. Okay, why does God this? Listen to 3 and 4. We've got the martyrs. They got the hearts, and they're going to sing a song. Let's see, listen to three and four. And sang the song of Moses, the servant of God, the song of the Lamb. Great and marvelous are your deeds, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways. Just and true are your ways. Kings of the ages, who will not fear you, O Lord, the great glory to your name. For you alone are holy. All nations will come. All right. So now we have this picture, and he's seeing this in, in, unfolding in, in heaven because they, they died, they're martyred, but they're, they're, they've gone on to be with the Lord, their spirit has, and they're given these hearts, and they begin to sing, and it's incredible. Now, this is probably not what it sounds like, but realize this is a song that they sing. So I'll do this kind of like they do in some uh, some churches and stuff. You can turn the radio on here, and it's all right. Great and marvelous are your deeds, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways. See, they're singing these songs, all right? King of the ages, who will fear you, O Lord, and bring glory to your name? For you alone are holy. I'm not trying to make a song out of this, but it's stunning in a, in a song, in a reference, in a singing kind of way. All nations will come and worship before you. For you are right, for your righteous acts have been revealed. And so they're singing. I can just see him doing this harp. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, how's that? You got a Who will fear you if this will not fear you? All right, good. Who will not fear you? Good, all right, you right, listen to the lyrics, all right. So they're singing this song and they're playing these harps. It's an incredible picture that they're that they're singing. Now realize that this isn't just kind of an insignificant little thing. Okay, so they die and they're playing harps and singing a little song or repeating some words. There's so much involved. This right here is such a huge thing that brings so much together. And I like the way, this is why I got ahead of myself. This is what Wearsby kind of says it this way. This entire scene that John is seeing at this point, the entire scene is reminiscent of Israel coming out during the Exodus. The nation had been delivered from Egypt, like these people had been delivered from the earth, out of the fire, right? Um, they, Israel had been delivered from Israel by the blood of the Lamb. By the blood of the Lamb. Think of that during the tribulation. We've seen the, the Lamb that was slain during, through, all throughout the description in Revelation. And the Egyptian army had been destroyed by the Red Sea. And what happened when the people saw that God had not only delivered them from Egypt and set them free, but destroyed the enemy like Babylon is going to be destroyed, all right? Because we've got to keep this as a whole picture. When they saw that, the nation of Israel stood on the waters of the sea, the crystal sea, the nations that came out of that, the martyrs, they came out of the sea and they stood on the edge of the sea and they began to sing. And what did they sing? The nation of Israel, Old Testament, out of the book of Exodus, the second book of the thing, what did they sing? Great and marvelous are your deeds, Lord God Almighty. They sang the song of Moses. They sang the song of Moses. And so that first part, verse 3, is the song of Moses. 
these martyrs in heaven now playing the harps and singing the same song that Israel sang when they came out of Egypt and were delivered from the, the from the oppression of, of the uh, of the Egyptians. All right, they began to sing that song. Peter, Paul, I uh, know, let me get up for that. Okay, so not only do we have that, but we have the, the song of Moses there. By the way, that is I have my reference there. I don't know if I, that is Exodus chapter fifteen. If you want to go home and learn the song, all right, or sing the song, Exodus chapter fifteen is the song of Moses. The reference there. All right, so they sing the song of Moses. That's not all they sang. They also sang the song of the Lamb. And so the second part of that, of, of verse 4 and following, in that same song, was the song of the Lamb. Who will not fear you? There you go, Gina. Who will not fear you? Who will not fear you, O Lord, and bring glory to your name? This is, this is fear and reverence of Christ that they'll sing about. All right? Not only the deliverance, but uh, the reverence. I found this, and I like it. I have to read fast. All right, listen to this. Do we fear the, word, the Lord? Do we have the kind of reverence for the Lord that we ought to? We do. We <coughs> do. We often don't, all right? There's a world that doesn't respect God like that, reverence God. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, all right? But some people really don't have, have the fear they need to. Peter and Paul on that do the Left Behind series, uh, they re referenced a, an opinion poll. It said, especially in North America, so we think of here in the United States, that 93 to 95% of people say, yep, when I die, I'm going to go to heaven, all right? But then they say, you look at the moral decay of our society, and there's no way, they're not passing judgment, but they're saying they may think that the you know, majority may think we live in a Christian nation and we have God's favor and yeah, we're going to go to heaven. But the fact of the matter is, when we look around us and the evil of the Western society, by the way, which has gone out, we're to take the gospel of the whole world, we have also as a society taken corruption. And, and others, you know, why do you think some people like North Korea, you know, they're corrupt <laughs> in their own way. They don't want any of that outside influence, all right? It goes in and corrupts and stuff, and so we've, we've seen that as well. So he, the, Peter and, and uh, Paul Lalonde are saying that even though people think here in the West that they're all going to heaven, the majority probably do not have the love of Christ in their heart. So they may think they're going, but they don't. And so that's where the Song of the Lamb comes in place. And so this, this last portion in 4 talks about the fear and the glory. Uh, fear and glory is what that psalm is talking about. So when it talks about this reverential uh, view of God, it says uh, in this thing that I found, it says, Jesus should, Jesus should be feared and glorified because He alone is holy. He is the only one who, uh, to, uh, he is the only one to live by all of God's standards, the only one worthy of our worship, the only one Ne that never sinned, he has been hallowed and set apart of God's special purpose and atonement for our sin. That's number one. Number two, Jesus should be feared and glorified because he will be worshipped by all nations. He will be worshipped by all nations. The day will come when he when he will deal with the godless leaders of this world. That's what we're talking about. We're leading towards the uh, Armageddon. He will do away with them and every nation then will worship him. Number three, Jesus should be feared and, and glorified because His righteousness, righteous acts will be revealed. See, all this, we're in the book of Revelation, the book to reveal Christ, to reveal God's plan, and all this is revealing God as the supreme God. God is the only true judge. God is the ruler. Jesus is the king of kings and, and the triumphant one that will come back and rule, rule the world. Alright? And so that's what will happen. He will deal with those that did not accept his mercy. If you don't accept his mercy, you have no hope. If you do accept his mercy, guess what? If you're not going to get around for the, the heart. You don't get a heart if you're not well, okay? But you're going to get better get part of the first seat. Okay? That this the clear crystal sea that sings the praises of God. Their song is, is similar. One thing, we talked about songs, we talked about this, uh, I, I kind of joked around talking about the choir practice and everything. Remember we, we heard reference to the song that only the uh, uh, only the 144,000 will be able to sing. We talked about that, I think it was last week in chapter 14. There's a song that only they get to sing. Just those that were sealed by God during this tribulation. These are the ones that are martyred. They're singing a different song. While the song that the 144,000 sing, only they apparently can know and sing that song. 
This song is being sung by the martyrs that come out of the Great Tribulation, but this particular song can be sung by any saint. All right? So it can be sang by that same group that is in the Crystal Sea that was referenced by all Old Testament saints, all by all those that choose God and die and are martyred during the first part of the tribulation. All of us can sing this song right here. All right? So that's a reference to that. All right? We're going to get done. Okay, verse 15. I'm going to fly through these last few verses, but we'll see. All right? So what is verse... Uh, verse I said 15. There's no verse 15. What about verse 5? All right, who wants verse 5? All right, you got it, Rick. After these things I looked, the temple of the tabernacle of the temple of heaven was open. The temple, the tabernacle, the temple of God was open, all right? This is an interesting scene that unfolds right here. We go from the angels with the bowls to these this crystal sea and these... Uh, and these that are singing this song, and all of a sudden he sees the temple. All this is in heaven or from heaven. He sees the temple open and the, the, the Ark of the Covenant. And he looks, and, and John sees this, and what is open but that Ark of the Covenant. And what is in the Ark of the Covenant? One of the things is the law. I never thought of this before. If John got to see what we're going to get to see, all right, is what those uh, Israelites got to see when Moses came down on the mount from the mount, and he said, "This is God's law, and this law will guide you." And it's what they had, all right. And this law was not what saved them, but the law pointed out their need to be saved. All right, and it was always the schoolmaster to say, "You'll never live up to these ten commandments, but they're God's law, and this is perfection. You'll never reach it, but this is the goal. And when you do something wrong, you're going to be held accountable for it. All right, for all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. Of the glory of God. That goes back to the law and the, and the commandments, what we're commanded to do and not do. In the Garden of Eden, is a little more simple. Just don't eat of that one tree. Is the one they do? They ate of the tree. All right. Now we have just ten laws. Can't keep them either. You know we don't. But the same law that was so significant that they put it in an ark and traveled around and finally ended up in the Holy Land and in their Promised Land. And then eventually, when the temple Solomon built the temple and they brought David brought the ark back and and they brought it back. And how significant this was. The same ark will be opened up in heaven. Now, is it the literal ark of the covenant that was on earth that has been taken to heaven? Or could this be an ark in heaven that the ark on the earth was patterned after? You pick. I don't know. All right? I'm just going to say it's the ark. All right? Because that same ark is opened up and there's the law. There's the commandments. I think we're going to get to see the literal tablets that Moses brought down off the mountain. I can't prove that. But I kind of think we might get to. John got to see it. Alright, it's pretty cool. Alright, so that was he sees this opening up. Remember the significance of the Holy of Holies? That's when Christ came and died and the, and the, and the curtain was, was torn from the top to the bottom. And what only one man could go in once a year and see, because that was the presence of God and the holiness of God was so concentrated in that one place where the Ark of Covenant was, was opened up for all. Alright, that happened in the day of Christ. But then God's presence was, presence was no longer confined to that. With the coming of the at Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came and dwelt among man and all that kind of stuff. So it lost its significance that way. And yet they're coming back to that. So it's still significant. Gene. Chapter 5. Keep in mind, too, anything about the ark and the tablet that should be in the testimony of the temple came to be. With the okay, back up to back home. Oh. Verse five. Verse five only. It says, listen, listen, listen. Land up. <laughs> okay. After this, I looked and I saw in heaven the temple. Okay, so the temple. That is the tabernacle of the testimony. This is the tabernacle of the testimony. That's the reference there. Is the is the ark. That's the reference. Okay. All right. And he saw this all being opened up. He saw that opened up, and it, it was the law. And they, they got to sing. Remember, we just talked about Moses. They were singing the song of Moses. Moses went up and got the dead. The, okay, and this was the ark of that covenant. All right? Thank you for asking that. Clear that up. Verse 6 then, all right? Who's got 6? Dan, you were going to read a minute ago. Verse 6. Verse 6. Uh, yeah. The temple came to seven angels with the seven plagues. 
They were dressed in clean, shining linen and wore golden sashes around their chest. All right, angels stand up. No, I'm just kidding. All right, no, that's our seven angels right here, all right? Uh, all of a sudden, he sees his angels. We started out with the angels. Now he goes back to them. He sees them coming out of this temple that's being opened up, all right, and the, and the, uh, the tabernacle of the testimony. And he sees them coming out with these bowls, golden bowls, not styrofoam bowls, all right? So I should have spray painted those or something. But these golden bowls. And then it talks about their wardrobe, their garments, and their gold sashes, and all that kind of stuff. All that's got some symbolism but, or significance, but we're not going to have to then describe it here. But, Imagine the picture that he's he's now seeing of these angels that are coming out to do what? To pour out these last to, to complete God's judgment and, and wrath, alright? And verse seven. Who wants seven? Alright, you got it. Then one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls filled with the wrath of God, who lives forever and ever. Okay, so we have God handing out harps, but we have one of the four living creatures. Where, where did they come from? Where did we start talking about the four living creatures? Around the throne, way back here when the church was raptured, we had the altar and the judgment seat of Christ and all that. We started talking about these four living creatures along with the crystal sea, and that's the church that was raptured out. Talk, we've been talking about these four living creatures who were already there around the throne, and then we as the church joined them there. And it's one of those four living creatures that was around the throne that, that hands those angels those golden bowls of wrath to be poured out. So he's just seeing. All this is have not happening yet. It's just all the preparation for that. Finally, we get to verse 8. What's verse 8? All right, you got one? Verse 8. Last verse. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from power. And no one could enter the temple until the seventh place of seven angels. Okay, I hope all this brings our all the scriptures and the time that I'm trying to bring in about how these scriptures bring about not just a single event, but not only this stuff right here, but how it ties into everything else. As this is happening, and as the temple's being opened up and the angels are now coming out to pour out the wrath, then he sees the, the smoke that is from the presence of God. We've seen this before, all right? Uh, remember how God's presence in, in with Moses, pillar of, of fire by night? And a cloud during the day. So we see this cloud, this smoke, all this stuff represent God, and it fills, it fills the temple. So much so that for whatever reason, at this point, it says no one now who would enter the temple. Well, the angels have been going in and out of the temple. Uh, all the Old Testament saints and all the all those in and out of the temple. We, uh, all that that we talked about that's happening during the tribulation when we're up in heaven, listen, we're not sitting on a, on, on a bleachers looking down at what's happening. We're enjoying heaven and being in the presence of the Lamb and, and, and our, our groom and all that stuff and in and out of the temple. But at this moment, it all stops. And what he sees right here now is no one can now enter the temple until all of this takes place which is chapter 16, the seven bowls, but we're going to be talking about it all the way until chapter 19. Everything stops. Business as usual stops. And no one can enter the temple uh, The temple until it, your last fill in the blanks, so the, the smoke fills the temple until it is complete. What is it? The seven bowls, the seven plagues, but you could just say it is the judgment. All right, the wrath of God, the completion of His judgment will be done. All right, there's a few things yet to come, but this is the judgment on the earth, and God got to pass this judgment until the seven bowls are completed. Right here, no one can enter the temple in the presence of God. And the smoke fills the temple. Cool stuff. Perfect timing. Next week we'll start with chapter 16. We'll start dumping out the bowls. You all come and sit in the same spot and I'll give you your bowl we'll back. All right. All right. Let's uh, let's be dismissed. All right. All right. Why don't you dismiss us in prayer, please?